Greetings, I'm Scott King, your host for this edition of Difference Makers, Episode 5, the show where we'll celebrate the teachers of the Atlanta public school system. Question, what do you get when you take a physical education teacher from Fickett Elementary School, a math teacher from the West End Academy, a kindergarten teacher from Usher Elementary School, and a third grade teacher from Mary Lynn Elementary School, and put them all together? You got it, a remarkable hour of education programming. Thank you for tuning in. Today's segment starts off here at Southwest Atlanta's Fickett Elementary School on the campus. Unknowingly, I was in for quite a treat today. When I had the pleasure of working with our first difference maker, it was not so much the story being produced, but the life lessons that I was able to take away that had me so surprised. I left the school with a newfound perspective on health and an appreciation for physical fitness from this seasoned educator. So let's go in with no further ado and talk with Ms. Jocelyn Williams. And I should warn you that you need to be prepared to get fit and get motivated in this story. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, count loud, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, good job. Leg straight, right at the waist, 37, 38, 39, 40. Motivation, give me that motivation. Give yourself a hand. What tone are we on now, boys and girls? First of all, good morning. Uh, the million dollar question I start with everyone is, um, tell me how you got into teaching or tell me, tell me your story. You said, listen, we're going back 30 years, but give us the accelerated version. Uh, the accelerated version was I started in nursing and I have a deep passion for helping people and going about trying to make sure everybody's comfortable. And I knew when I was in education and trying to get my degree in nursing, I wanted to do something more. So I found my purpose and that was teaching. So I came back from Alabama, Tuskegee, Alabama, and decided to come into teaching with the Atlanta Public Schools way back in 1983, and I've been here ever since. And you came back teaching, or you were a physical education teacher? I'm a physical time? education teacher. I've transferred from nursing to physical education, teach a lot of science courses, physiology, kinesiology, so I moved right into physical education without a problem at all. You know, this is kind of an opportunity. Uh, this is the first time I've had a chance to converse with a physical education teacher. So it's um, it's going to be a learning experience for me and, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, an opportunity to dispel myths, if you would. Uh, let's talk about how physical education, we kind of have this thing that, oh, we're going to gym class, we're going to run around and have fun. Why is physical education so important? We talk about wellness now, but how do you fit into the equation? Um, Physical education is very, very important. It's wellness, and I get the opportunity to teach the whole child. The child that is physical, mental, social, and emotional. They not only come to learn in physical education, reading, and writing. We start with uh, something that I created. It's a fitness book. It has my standards in it. It has pictures for the students who don't like to read. And we sit down, talk about what we're going to learn before we go to run, and go to skip and jump, learn how to spell the word, what does it mean, and correlate it to language arts and make it fun. And then when they come to the gym, I put on music and we just have a good time putting everything together. Now I'm going to wind my own clock back to, we'll, we'll, we'll say the years about 1979. I remember physical education myself in a, in a, in a faraway place, but it, it was very important. As I grew up, I was really into athletics, but it was, it was, those, it was the building blocks I was given to how to stay in shape and why am I stretching and, and all. We, do we take that for granted as, a, as adults and children? Uh, we take it for granted. Um, without your health and strength, the reason I'm able to sustain for 30 years, I make sure that I take care of my well-being. Having my family and my friends talk to me, we go out, we share, we fellowship. And when you do things in the social setting, it's very important. Gia! Gia, come on, girl. I love it. Smile. I love it. Keep going. March in place. Off the steps. Then 
Let's talk about the passion for the work. I saw you running around, moving, and and uh, getting the kids motivated with the stretches. What what brings your passion for the job? Uh, what brings my passion is the work that is set out for the students. Um, the 21st century student has a lot of information that they need to bring to the table when they get ready to compete on a global level. I want the students to know you have to feel good about yourself. If you know that you're special, and if you know that you have a talent and a gift, something that no one else can do, the students feel good about themselves. I then take all of the information from the child and let them know wherever you are, it starts with you feeling good about yourself and letting them know that they can do absolutely anything that they put their mind to. So you brought up an interesting point. You're not just running around the room doing jumping jacks. You're, you're teaching etiquette, it sounds like, life lessons. Yes. And, Lifelong uh, learners is what my goal and my aim and my vision is, to take the whole entire child, to let one, them know we're going to start two, with the physical, up. but I need you to talk to me, explain it to me. What does that mean? Make your words clear. Because television, I, I give an example, suppose the cameras come to your neighborhood and someone was hurt or injured or there was an emergency and you were on TV and you only had 60 seconds to tell them something important. I teach the children to be quiet, to focus, to pay attention, to be respectful, and this makes all the difference in a job interview and starting on their, their path to their careers. And it boosts that confidence as yes, well. Yes. And as well. Self esteem is very important in the health and fitness arena. We see the stars all the time, but all of us cannot be stars, but we still will be asked to come out and do something special on TV. Your boss will say, Go and talk to the PTA. Oh my goodness. Go and talk to the parents. So the children have to be ready to come out on the global stage at any time. And health and fitness is a very important part of that. Give me insight into the Thicket community. I've come here several years for various reasons, and uh, it's always nice to come back. But share with me what the culture is like here and what makes Thicket such a wonderful place. Thicket is a wonderful place to work. It's a wonderful place to visit. The number one thing that we do here at Thicket is call each other the Thicket family. An example, we bought, built a Kaboom playground in the back, and I was uh, the spearhead of it, and I was so excited. I had friends that would go around on the radio stations and ask the community to come in. When the community knows that Ficket, which is a family, needs anything, they come together as a unit. The children start. Uh, UPS is one of our sponsors, and we have uh, gifts that come in every year. The children, we just came from the Universal Soul. They say, bring in a can. They'll bring in one can, they're bringing some rice. So whatever we ask the community to do, if there's a need or if there's a function, they come together as the Thicket family, and it's really a family if you're in need or something special is being asked of you. Our PTA leads the way with that charge. Uh, as, as a show called Difference Makers, how do you feel uh, you make a difference here each day? Um, each day I come to Thicket is an honor and a blessing because I get a chance to touch the children in a special way, letting them know that they're special and that anything that they can believe in and dream, they can do it. It starts with health and physical education because that's what I start with, but I let them know that if they want to tell me something or if they have a dream or whatever they did at home, I pull it into my own to let them know that I am concerned. If I see them in the neighborhood or at Kroger's or at Camp Creek Parkway or at the movies, I let them know and their family know I'm their teacher and tell them something special that I remember about them. So that's how I make a difference. Getting into the individual child, even though I teach over 300 children a week at the school, they're all special to me. Let's dispel the other myth I asked the other teachers. So you don't go home at 3.30 each day or as soon as the bell rings. You're not, you're not tailing the last bus out of here. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, uh, everyone needs to know that because they think teachers uh, just have a short day and that's that. And some days maybe it is. I notice on Fridays everyone's gone. But. Well, on Fridays I try to relax. Teaching is a way of life. It's my purpose. It's a gift that I've been given to give to others. So I don't just look at it as a job or as a career. It's a lifestyle. Do you have students who said, well, I don't want to exercise? Or how do you motivate those kids that just maybe are not with, with it? The number one thing that I've found is that music is the medium that joins us all together. The children have favorite songs that they like, so I have a, a professional DJ make the music, take the words out, and it just has the beat 
and it just has the driving sound. I have my own personal sound system, just like a DJ, and I bring it, it's wired like a, a mic, uh, and the children, I become the DJ, almost like a LA thicket, and the children began to get excited. Even though we don't have everything we need, the music motivates them, and those students who can't do what I need them to do, I differentiate it to ask them, what can you do? They say, well, I can't dribble the ball. I say, well, you need a softer ball, or a ball that has less air. Whatever they need, I individualize it to make it fun and personable, and that way they love it. All the lessons that we do in physical education can be captivated. Captivated means that I want you to see what we're doing here in the classroom first, and then we will move outside. Talk about what we saw in the classroom there, and actually when they wrote down on the clipboard their observations. So talk about the, the writing side of this. A lot of the students couldn't understand what I was saying. They couldn't put the pictures with, with a ball and they didn't understand the heart because they couldn't see it. So what we do, we learn about the heart in the book that I wrote for the students. We look at the heart, the diagram of the heart. The words are there. It's in a font that's maybe 18 to 24. It's a size that they can see, they feel comfortable. And I always do everything on cue. Ready in three, giving the students time, those who can't read, and I partner them with their friends. like an interest survey. So if you don't like to read, then Sally can help you read or John can help you read. And then they have pictures. So whatever we do in the classroom per lesson is transformed into my class out in the gym. So we do the exercises. Then when they come out, the cone that we talked about on paper is now a real cone. The jumping jack that they saw in the book is now a real jumping jack. And everything becomes alive and they get excited. The clipboard is an extension. The children get a chance to know that the teachers and I are friends. The teacher says that we need to write a little bit more. Time for the CRCT. We have to listen and follow directions. So it's just a carryover of everything that the classroom teacher does. I just extend the lesson a little bit more. You, know, you mentioned how long you've been doing this. What was physical education like back then compared to now? And the world has changed and wellness and, you know, it's, it's much more hip to be fit now. Um, so let's talk about that progression of, of uh, and how it, things have changed since you started. Back in 1983, I had five schools. Every day I would put all my equipment into my little car and I would have to take my equipment from place to place. I didn't have a space. I would be either in a portable, I would be in a trailer, or there was really nothing special about physical education. It was just something that was there. But now as it evolved, we see that your health and your fitness, your well-being, your mind, we can see in the news today, people are stressed and worried and frustrated, and it's because they, they're not taking care of themselves. So it's transformed from being unimportant to the number one thing, knowing that it's the entire person. It's not just how well in shape you are, it's your mind. Are you socially okay? Is everything okay at your home? So that's how it's transpired, from something that we have to do to something that we need to do. It's a very important, integral part of everything we do. Your entire being is based on health and fitness and your well-being. That's how it's changed from 1983 to 2013. What I would like to tell everyone is that physical education is very, very important. It's a part of life that we think is running and jumping and sweating and going out, but it's the entire person. Making people feel good about themselves, knowing they need to make changes, knowing that they're not perfect, but at least you can start where you are and then take a step each day, small steps, drinking some water, parking the car just a little bit further, asking a friend to hold you accountable for some things. This is physical education in the 21st century, including that I know I'm not the best I can be. Oh, I could do better. Oh, I shouldn't have drank that, shouldn't have eaten that, but I'm gonna get up every day and start fresh. This is the new physical education I would like to teach people for the 21st century. I'm not the best, but I can always do better. Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. 
I look up to a lot of the older heads, you know, the, the innovators, the heads of the art movements of the past. They kept it really edgy and like a lot of the Latin American muralists and Latin American artists and um, their styles were very unique and new to their time. You know, somewhat controversial, but that's who I look up to mainly. Personally, I'm very excited about going to college. It's something new and it's something different than what I'm used to. I'm definitely gonna be a little out of my element, but um, that's what makes it so exciting is that, you know, it's something fresh. Well, there's so many opportunities that I think I could miss out on if I didn't go, you know? Getting into college takes planning and vision. You know, it's just like when I take a brick wall and turn it into a canvas for my art. Paintings help me realize that I've got what it takes. We move on to the West End Academy where we find our next difference maker in a very unique learning environment on the site of what used to be the former Blaylock Elementary School. With confidence, this seasoned math and science teacher finds fulfillment here. On his journey from corporate America in Detroit to classroom America in the Atlanta Public Schools, he knows he made the right choice. I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with our next difference maker, Mr. Dan D. Ferguson. Purpose yeah, square. Yeah, yeah. Purpose. Oh, uh, five. Purpose square. Numbers. Oh, one, four, nine. Right. Nine. What's uh, next? Sixteen. Okay, now. Well, I four. actually started studying engineering. Um, I went to the University of Michigan. As you know, Detroit is what was considered Motown, Motor City. Um, both my parents worked for one of the auto companies, so it was the expectation that I would be an engineer. You know, I had the background in math and science, and so I started down the road to becoming a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. um, probably a little past halfway through my career at the University of Michigan, I started working in the field where I was um, doing some internships as well as a co-op. I worked with the uh, emissions laboratory, the EPA, and it just it just didn't do anything for me. I, it was a job, and I could see where I could be successful and make, you know, a nice salary, but I felt like I needed more. And so at that time, um, I was working with uh, my, the campus organization that sponsored mentorship and tutoring programs, and that was something that I enjoyed doing. Um, I looked forward to it. I looked forward to working with the young people and giving them all the knowledge and wisdom that I had to try to make life better for them. And one of the main things that kind of pushed me towards education was I saw the trend with African-American African children, um, there being fewer and fewer black males in their households and being positive role models. And that was something that I felt had a strong impact. My father was there for me throughout my life and he was like that model. And I, I thought about myself and where I would be if he wasn't out of the picture. And so it kind of made me think about how fortunate I was and how I needed to give some of that back to others. 20 plus 7. Okay, is that, is that just 20? Yeah, it's a minus. Okay. It's, it's 20, it's minus 20. Yeah, that's, the sign always is attached to the number that follows it. So when you see a minus in front of a number, you can look at that as being a negative number. How do you uh, combat that challenge of uh, people not liking your uh, area of study? Yeah, that's very difficult. Um, and on this level, the higher math, you know, when you get to high school and we deal mostly with 11 and 12 graders, math gets more involved, more complicated, and students often ask the question, where will I ever use this? I don't need this. I know what I want to do in life, and it has nothing to do with this. And, and, and it's hard, or a lot of times, it's hard to tell them, no, you will definitely need this trigonometry here, there, or whatever the career they might choose. But what I do emphasize are those problem-solving skills that you get from math, the, the critical thinking that math helps develop. And I let them know that any job that, that you would want that pays a decent salary will require you not to just take orders, but th to be a problem solver, to be a critical thinker. And those are the direct skills that you get from apl applying math. Let's kind of change it up a little bit. I'm, I'm at the Weston Academy. Yes, 
And uh, I've, uh, the concept is new to me, and this is my first visit just yesterday. So okay. I'm kind of excited about being here, but maybe you can bring me up to speed as to the culture here, what Western Academy is all about. Okay. And uh, just kind of fill me in as to your model and, and uh, something else I want to ask you, but I'll let you start with that. Okay, well, well basically the uh, purpose of Western Academy is to give opportunities for young people who are potential dropouts, who might be behind, um, aren't on schedule to graduate. Um, we give them the flexibility to make up those credits and to actually graduate on time or as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, because of our setup, you know, we, we use a lot of uh, computer generated curriculum um, because we have to meet the needs of every student that comes. And we have a lot of flexibility in terms of offering students the courses that they need where their home school may not have that same flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, so we work, on, work with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis to make sure that they meet all the standards for the courses that they're taking. But in, in a given class, you might have five to six different courses going on at the same time. So it's not, it's not a setup where you have a teacher standing in front of a class and everyone's working in small groups. Everybody could be working on something completely different, but we, we act more as facilitators to make sure that students can continue to make progress and move towards graduation. It's a very nice work environment, too, as uh, I absolutely. move this, around. I, I, I'm a connoisseur of the quiet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is probably the best uh, teaching environment that I've been in in my career. Share with me how the model works. It, for somebody at home sitting on the couch, I said, well, I was in a classroom of 30 of us, and we all did the same thing at the same time. I know you kind of alluded to that, but uh, this model, the small class size, independent study, so it must be a lot of focused attention. Absolutely. Um, we, we work hard to develop the culture from the start of the semester when students come. And again, we have students transitioning every semester. So we might have some students graduating uh, in December. You know, we might have a, a large group coming in in January. But each semester, we let them know what our expectations are. And every class, we let them know what the setup is, our expectation in terms of this being an opportunity that other people are waiting for and so that you want to be mindful and take it seriously. And how, how most classes are set up is every class is broken down into units we call modules. Each module ha gives a pretest that's taken on the computer and based on that student's knowledge they're given lessons that will fill in the gaps. After each lesson there's a quiz and once they complete all the lessons there is a, uh, a unit test called the mastery assessment. So their, their grades are based on how they do on their lessons as well as their scores on the mastery test. Share with me your thoughts on uh, the myths of being a teacher. Well, again, like you said, they, they, most people believe that we have a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. And it may appear like, like, it may appear to be so, but a lot of that time is spent um, planning. Um, developing our, our skills, uh, professional development. I know during the summer I'm often you know, going to several different trainings so that I can become a better teacher and I can deliver whatever curriculum to my students and things are always changing. You know, we change from one set of standards to another and you always need to be aware of you know, what, what are the strategies that are going to be best to get students to where they're going. There are new assessments, you know, um, every so many years and you have to make sure that you are ready and preparing the students. Now, you know, recently we were transitioning to Common Core. The tests that will be associated with Common Core are way different from what you've seen in the past with GPS. You won't only have the, you know, multiple choice, but there'll be, you know, open-ended questions, you know, things that our students aren't necessarily used to seeing on, you know, standardized tests. And these are things that they need to be experiencing in the classroom. So, in terms of work, yeah, I usually don't leave until maybe 5.30, you know, something, depending on what's going on, what time of year. Like now, like I said, we're doing graduation test preparation. So oftentimes after school, I'm doing tutoring. I'm doing tutoring before school. And you know, even during lunch, I, I give up my lunch time just to make sure that students are receiving the support that they need. Mm -hmm. So the model um, is, 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 has been effective? Yes, well, from what I've seen, and, and, I, and I've been in a more traditional setting um, where 
um, students don't necessarily get that same one-on-one -on -one attention. You know, you have larger class size, class size, and you know, I think more often students kind of slip through the cracks. Um, we're the uh, we're the catcher of those students that have fallen through the cracks in some of their other schools. So I think this is a wonderful place. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And fortunately, you know, many of our students, you know, really take advantage of it and they're able to move on to the next phase in life. I'm going to safely assume there are some men watching this right now, and they're probably asking, it's like, gosh, that's I'm in a similar situation. Okay. Uh, maybe let's play finish the sentence. Um, I would like to teach, but what should I know? Um, well, in order to teach at, at this point in time, um, there, there's assessments that you can take if you are looking to get you know, a provisionary um, certification. Um, as long as you have a degree, there are options for you to transition into you know, education. A good program that I've worked with is Teach for America um, that I've seen many people transition into education. Um, but you, you, have to, you have to be committed, you, you have to have patience, and you have to understand that things don't happen immediately. One of the things that affects us as teachers is, you know, we put our heart into it, and we don't always see the reward uh, right in front of us, you know. Sometimes we plant seeds, and those seeds don't blossom until years uh, down the road. There have been times where I've run into students that I've taught, you know, many years ago who are doing things with themselves, that, and they're at a different stage in life. You know, you didn't necessarily see that. And so you, you just have to know that you're doing what's best for your students and that eventually, you know, the, the payoff will be there. It might not be financially, you know, but again, this is not something that you go into for a financial gain. A couple things. This is my, my 12th year in education. Um, it's been it's been something of something of a roller coaster ride. There have been great highs and there have been some lows, um, but overall, I'm, I'm definitely satisfied with my career choice. I'm glad I made that switch from engineering. Um, I would encourage more, um, especially men, and if I can say this, especially black males, they are missing in the households, and our young people need those role models. You know, they need to see, and that one of the reasons you see me in a suit today, one of the reasons why I wear suits, you know, pretty much every day is because, you know, our young men don't see that. You know, they're used to seeing even older men sagging their pants, you know, wearing jeans, wearing, you know, streetwear. And they, they're not used to seeing how a professional man looks, you know. And so I think they need to see it. They don't just need to hear about it, they need to experience it. And so I will welcome, you know, all men, you know, I mean, women are doing a great job in education, don't get me wrong, but I think we need some of that balance. This is my fourth year with Atlanta Public Schools, and so far it's definitely been a great experience. I've been teaching in urban settings, you know, inner city, quote unquote, at risk youth, um, all of my career. Um, and I've seen education done poorly, you know, and I've seen education done, you know, where they're making strides and moving in the right direction. And I would definitely have to say in APS that we are definitely moving in the right direction. Not saying we everything is correct and perfect at this point, you know, there's definitely a lot of room for growth. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I definitely feel like, you know, this is one district where they're actually focused on the kids. Looking for these? You drive buzzed. Could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Thanks for calling the GED Pep Talk Center. Jerry Stiller speaking. Your level seven in your face pep talk. I can keep pushing. 
Believe me, I'm good at it. Once you've got your GED diploma, you'll feel so good about yourself. You come. Mr. Trejo, can I transfer this guy to you? He needs something a little more... Persuasive? Whatever motivation you need, we've got a pep talk for you. Get your GED pep talk and find free classes at yourged.org. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. I'm just off 285 here on the west side of Atlanta at a gem of an educational facility. That'd be Usher Elementary School. My visit takes me to a personal class favorite of mine, kindergarten. The educator you're about to meet believes that her grade level is one of the most important and it's the first opportunity for her students to establish their educational independence. Let's go inside and meet educator Ashley Weems. Good morning to you. I can't hear you. I can't Good. Can There's so much to do. Um, initially, um, my grandmother is taught and was teaching in education for 30 years and my mother is a teacher as well so I've always been centered around education and working with children and serving children but I decided to go a different route my undergrad year and I decided to go with psychology I wanted to be a marriage and family um, therapist and upon graduation I thought about it again and I finally told my mother that you know she's always told me that I was going to be a teacher and I called her and I was like I think you're right I think this is what I'm supposed to be doing and so I got within the educational field and I've been here ever since Kinder kindergarten I would say is a very important great level to work with and with kindergarten they are far from babies they come in wanting to be independent you know a lot of them have been with their parents and in pre-k classrooms so they they yearn for that independence and you know taking responsibility of their education and the lights and the the light in their eyes when they finally learn how to read and they start reading it's just amazing to see how they came in from the beginning of the year and I always do that at May. I show them something they drew in August. And they're like, I did not draw that. I'm like, yeah, that was you. So it's amazing that the transition they make over time. Talk about the parent support and uh, just the whole community in here and why Usher is such a great place. Well, Usher Curry Elementary School is very community driven. Um, we definitely believe in making sure that the parents are an integral part of educating children here. We have different programs set in place by Parent Teacher Association, our PTA, with parent, um, parent night, curriculum night, various after school activities for children to participate in so that we ensure that we have that buy-in from the community because I think like any other school we definitely believe that it definitely takes a village and that that includes everybody not just the teacher and those within the building it includes those on the outside within the community as well as far as a teacher what are some of the joys of uh, the profession that you like I think under the umbrella of a teacher, you realize immediately entering the field, you're so many other professions under that one umbrella. You get to be a nurse when needed. You are a counselor when needed. You even hone into that parental instinct when needed under that umbrella. And I think realizing that, you know, we know that the, the children that we serve are the cornerstone for our future. And that alone, knowing that we were a part of that is reward enough, you know, and knowing that we're helping them reach the goals that they have set and where they ultimately want to be in this world and how they want to contribute to the society. That's right. My favorite, mathematics. I have a math background myself, and uh, the kids seem to enjoy it as well. But talk about the activity you were doing there in class. Well, um, 
In my classroom, a lot of the instruction is student-centered driven instruction. A lot of grouping is done, especially doing the subject math. That is very, very important um, to do. So in one group, I had some students working with Fruit Loops and learning how to add using Fruit Loops. Um, a lot of students were working with pictures and you know matching those pictures with those numbers and taking those strategies that I've taught them using pictures to grasp the skill of addition and some students were completing the addition word problem storybook. And so reading the word problems and being able to figure out what the math problems should look like and to add illustrations to that. So it's a variety of manipulatives and things that are going on to make sure that we meet those interest level for our students as well. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, and your face will surely show. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, wiggle your feet. Ooh. If you're happy and you know it, wiggle your feet. No. I think to become an effective teacher, the number one thing you have to do is always carry a positive attitude. I think that that is very important in communication. I think that when, you, when you're able to communicate with the students, you build that relationship and with that trust. And especially what I found even in working with kindergarten, once you build that relationship and that trust with the students, then they, are more, they buy into the educational program that you have in your classroom. And then that communication overflows into the parents, into your colleagues, into the community, so all stakeholders are involved. I love teaching. I have a passion for it. It's what I know that I was put here to do was to serve children and impact the field of education in a mighty way. So to have that opportunity and to work Does with different kids, you know, day okay, in, day out, and, and to know that whatever they learn beyond the four walls of my classroom will help them succeed on the outside of the school is a great feeling. Okay, so uh, what is the importance of your uh, being a kindergarten, being in kindergarten instruction? What's the significance in the uh, school community? It is a powerful, powerful thing. Um, kindergarten, that's what we talked about earlier, dispelling the myths about kindergarten teacher, teachers. It is the hardest job I would say to do as to be a kindergarten teacher because you're laying their foundation. You're you're opening up how they feel about learning, how they feel about education, how they feel about even teachers. And like I said before, they're sponges and so they're soaking up everything that you present as it relates to information academically your behaviorisms, everything they're soaking up. So it's very important because we lay that foundation, we set the tone for the rest of their educational journey here in the kindergarten. Six, so whatever you want to draw, you draw on top of that number. Whatever you want to draw, you draw on top of that number. So what number is this? So how many things you have to draw? Good. Okay, if you want to do balloons, you can do that. Draw those four balloons in color. Y'all do the same thing. This is your box. So how many are you going to draw on top of that number? It's totally opposite from that. Um, you come in in the morning, kindergarten students, you have to be upbeat. You have to be refreshed. You have to constantly keep them engaged. Um, their attention span is very short, so they're the constant movement, not a lot of sitting, and you know, it's a fun grade level, but they're, as well as they're like sponges, so you are their first model, and they soak up everything you say, everything you do. I get so many parents saying that, you know, when they're at home on the weekend, I see them teaching their little dolls, and that, that must be what you're doing in the classroom, so, you know, it's it's, I wouldn't consider it an easy grade level, and they're far from babies. They they hone on to their independence doing that doing that gear in kindergarten. A lot of it. How long have you uh, taught? And um, just talk about how long you might have been here at Usher or at other places. Well, like I've mentioned before, I was a paraprofessional. I did that for two years, um, and I've been here at Usher for five years. Okay. This is my fifth year here at Usher Car Year. Okay, and now I understand that you are a Teacher of the Year. Yes, I am. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. 
What are some of the myths, I asked some of the other teachers this, but what are some of the myths that uh, we can dispel about being a teacher? Uh, do you get to go home at 3.30 every day? No. Okay. I, I <laughs> thought I would get a sincere no. So right. elaborate on that or what your day is like just coming in early in the morning. I mean, you know, you come in, of course, we have to be here by 7.30 in the morning. A lot of my other colleagues sometimes get here at 7.15 and 7. You know, always preparing for the day because, like I said before, once the children enter the classroom, you have to be ready. You have to be ready. And the day extends after 2.30, after 3, 3.30 because you're planning for the next day, the next day's activities, what you're going to do, what you can do differently that you did previously, you know, the day before, you know, you're working okay. with your other colleagues, so you're planning and trying to find meetings to work with your other colleagues collaboratively to see at that grade level what you all can do collectively, you know, to move children to the next level. So hypothetically, I'm at home kind of relaxing and I say, hey, I want to be a teacher. Um, I'm just going to walk in there and kind of do my thing. But we know it's not like that. Uh, what can someone expect if they want to teach or even be a kindergarten teacher? They, they can expect, they have to be flexible. Um, definitely come in there with the ability to know that there is not one way you can teach in a classroom. You have to be able to teach multiple ways because you have 20 different personalities, 20 different ways of learning. So I would say be flexible and be an effective communicator because building relationships and that trust with the students, again, with the parents and the other stakeholders is gonna be imperative to your success in the classroom. Yes, no help, did it by yourself. So how many you gonna put there? Use cookies, you haven't used cookies? When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified, not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who do something, the people who take action, are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making Home Affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Here at the GED Pep Talk Center, we have pep talkers standing by to get you motivated for your GED diploma. Text the name Terry to 69222 for a sympathetic pep talk. You show people what you really are. Or for a gentle pep talk, text the name Deborah. You know you're going to make people very proud of you. And if that's not enough, text the name Danny for an extreme pep talk. Prove everyone wrong. Show them you're the boss. Get your GED pep talk and find free GED classes. Text the name of the person you want a pep talk from to 69222. Read to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds.
Over the past six years, our last educator has definitely left her mark here at the Mary Lynn Elementary School in the Candler Park neighborhood of Atlanta. By self-admission, she openly admits that learning is just fun. So much so that she hopes that all children become autonomous, confident, critical thinkers who have a natural joy for learning. So with no further hold up, let's go inside and meet our last difference maker and educator of today, Ms. Lindsay Bichikowski. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap twice. I need to see all of my friends with their eyes on me. We're going to focus on this today, and this is going to be the primary goal, is to get all of these down. But this is the thing. Some of us are working. Really I was in journalism at, um, in college, and I decided from there um, that maybe journalism wasn't the place that I wanted to be, and I started substitute teaching. And I worked with second grade classes and third grade classes, and I just realized there that education is really um, gives people the ability to make choices in life and that really we could change a lot of society's problems by giving people access to education and making education accessible to everyone. So now I feel like in my classroom, that's my main objective, is to make sure that education is accessible to all of my students. Okay, I don't want to sound redundant, but uh, the follow-up question to that is often, um, you know, a lot of things we do in life, whether you feel like hiking, fishing, race car driving, a lot of the people are very passionate about their work. So, oh, I've been doing this 40 years, and every day I look forward to going to work. With teaching, what's your passion? What's your drive each day? Um, well, like I said, making education accessible to all students, but also teaching children that they have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, that they have a responsibility to the environment, they have a responsibility to their community. Um, they have responsibility to themselves to be the best person that they can be, and that's really beyond the curriculum. Um, I also, you know, really enjoy teaching the curriculum, but teaching kids that they have a responsibility to give back to their community and that they have a voice that they can actually use, that one person can really make a difference, um, is my passion, is what I focus on in my practice. So you each are holding a different mineral, you're looking at the attributes, and you're describing it to the other people who are also looking at your mineral, but looking at their own. Okay. Um, raise your hand if that helps you to maybe have a more systematic way to look at these minerals as well. Awesome. Okay. Gita, the kids work together so well. It was that, that was not centers, but that was just break out in your groups and they collaborated and even had a little leader within the group and is that your style or yeah we work a lot on community in my classroom and we work on how to work together um, in the new common core curriculum there's also a lot of standards on working in groups and having discussions so we worked on a lot of that at the beginning of the year and it's just has you know taken hold in the classroom so I can break them up into groups and they know exactly what to do they know how to have conversations about what they're working on mm -hmm. um, and they collaborate and it's all about collaboration because really two ideas is better than one mm -hmm. so you saw a lesson on uh, mineral I'm identification um, the today. students first are were exploring okay. the minerals using Great. their and five senses but for today's lesson they were really just using their five senses and using a magnifying glass getting get comfortable get with a magnifying glass to um, look at different attributes of minerals and to be able to notice different things so that they could really, like a scientist does, really, you know, look at the attributes and, right, th these are minerals, they're found in the ground and, you know, they have different properties and, and geologists, you know, use different tests to find out these properties, you know, and, and part of that is observation. Um, so I'm really just trying to teach the kids how to be really good observers, how to be astu uh, um, astute observers, um, and how to use all of their senses to really write down as much information as they possibly can get. We have sight, we have touch, we have smell, we have hearing. We're not going to do taste, so we all have all five. But what is there any other way that we came up here that you would that you think would be good for us to actually do to notice an attribute? The, most, the more training you can get, I think the better because you constantly need to be growing as a teacher. The world is always changing mm -hmm. and you need to be growing with it. So I'm always learning new things about science. I'm always learning new things about math. We go to trainings. I'm learning something different, not just about instruction, but also about the mathematics because as a teacher, you don't know everything about everything. That would be impossible. So you're also a learner. And that's what's really exciting about getting to be a teacher is that you get to learn with your students. Um, in my classroom, I really focus on project-based learning we do a lot of projects. 
So for example, the students now are working um, on freedom fighters and they're creating a project where they're actually becoming a freedom fighter and we're gonna do a living timeline in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done research on them and we've, we've incorporated into math with word problems. So we do all of these things and then we create a culminating project and then they communicate that. So I try okay. to do a lot of project-based learning and a lot of um, inquiry-based learning where they have a problem, they start with a problem and they are figuring out a solution through teamwork. Teachers need feedback and teachers need to have insights and, and know where they can grow. Um, and they also need encouragement. They need mo um, lessons modeled for them. Um, so I think that eventually I'd really like to do that. I'd like to you know, model lessons. I'd like to help teachers prepare. I'd like for, to help teachers um, play in units and things like that and be a coach. Here's a fun one I like to ask people. Uh, you say you've been teaching five years. I remember when I went to college, I remember the first day of college, you know, just being a college student. What was your first day of teaching anywhere? Just, just can you give a, a, a reflection moment and tell us what that was like? Um, you know, every year that I go into the classroom on the first day, I'm so nervous. The night before, I can't sleep. Because you're just meeting, you're meeting 22 new people. And, you know, you want them to accept you and to like you and to listen to what you have to say and to like your ideas and to want to learn from you. Um, you guys are so it's, it's really nerve-wracking. Okay? But usually so after that first day, a it's like, you know, so you just feel like you're in the right place and everything kind of comes together. So um, my first year of teaching um, was probably um, the scariest because you just, you I mean, you, you try to like act like you know what you're doing, but you really don't know what you're doing. Um, and so you just learn and grow from that, you know? And so now I realize that Sometimes I don't always know what I'm doing, but if I'm really honest with the students about it and I go, okay, you know, I don't know everything about this topic. Let's learn this together. Let's grow together. Um, they respect that. They don't think that you should know everything. I, I just wish that we as teachers more could be in each other's classrooms because I would really love to see what all the other teachers are doing. That's why I like um, what your program is doing here because it's exciting for people to see, okay, this is what this teacher is thinking, this is what her passion is, this is what she's doing in her classroom or he's doing in her classroom because we're isolated and inside of our doors and my team, we collaborate every single week and we sit down and we say, okay, what are we gonna learn this week? What are we doing? What are you doing in your classroom? What are your ideas? And that's really exciting because it gives me time to go, okay, this is another idea that I can use in my classroom that's gonna benefit my students. And I think that, um, you can't look at ideas as like, this is my idea that I can only use for my students. Because the more ideas you get, the better your instruction is gonna be. And some idea may not work for this group of students. This may be more a better fit. Exactly, and so you hear, oh, this person is doing this. Wow, that is such a great idea. I can take that idea and I can meld it into my own idea. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you have something that's really great that you can be proud of. So I love um, the collaboration. And even even in the trainings that you know APS will provide for us, sometimes, as good as the actual training is, it's all like the collaboration between the teachers is is even better. Where you're sitting with a group of your peers and you're saying, "Well, what are you doing about this? And what are you doing about this? And well, I have a student that is having trouble with this. Do you have any ideas?" Um, so getting those ideas and figuring out, you know, what you can do for the kids is what teaching is about. It's really exciting. First thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to do our observations. So I would like for you to make sure that you have this side of your sheet facing up. We're going to do observations on all of the attributes that we discussed. Any thought come to mind as to something that's a little bit challenging for you? I think, in general, teaching is really challenging. I think that um, there are always things that you look at in a lesson and you're like, ooh, I could have done that differently or I could have done that differently. And I think that that's part of being a good teacher is being able to see those things and constantly be looking for ways to improve. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, as a teacher, I'm always looking for ways to improve. I talk to my colleagues about it. I'll, you know, reflect after lessons. Um, but really, I think that that's what's so cool about being a teacher is that um, you can be creative and you can always be changing. You know, you're constantly mutating and doing different things. And, you know, from one year to another, I'll do, do the same lesson, but I'll do it just a little bit differently because I'll remember what I did from the previous year and what worked and what didn't work. So you're constantly honing your craft. So I had a student come in um, into my third grade class and he was reading on a first grade reading level. And, um, and there might be multiple children that, ha that have challenges. And you know, it's about identifying 
a need and then working for that need. So for example, this one child, um, you know, there were multiple people had worked with him and I just found some strategies that really worked with him. At the end of the year, he was reading on a fifth grade reading level. And so to see that before your eyes, to see somebody grow like that is pretty amazing and it makes you feel really good about what you're doing. Um, I also have, you know, other students that um, awesome. For example, the first grade, the first class that I taught, they're now sparkles. graduating high school. So I think you could write that one and down so, um, well, you know, right. not a lot of them come back right. and you, you know give me their success years? stories. But I imagine from them that they're going out into the world, and hopefully, you know, what I did in third grade with them made a difference. All right, what else are you noticing about that? It's kind of a turquoise color. Huh. I'm not going to tell you what that is. You're a scientist. You're a geologist right now. You're figuring out what that is. So we're just looking at its attributes. So what do you notice about it? What do you feel makes you a success story? I think I'm passionate about what I'm doing. I come to school every day and I'm focused on, you know, having those kids achieve, on having high expectations, on, you know, teaching the curriculum and also teaching the, the students how to care about the environment and care about themselves and have a responsibility to the community. Um, I also really enjoy working in the school that I work in with the people that I work with. I think that everybody, sometimes when times are tough, it actually helps you grow. And um, and there's a saying that, that um, I heard that, um, what you work hard for is That's what you right. love. Okay, what and so I think that we that? really do work hard to make a community here, and so I love it. So I try to create an environment where the students feel really safe to take risks. Um, that's one of the biggest areas that I work on. So we talk about in my classroom celebrating the struggle. Instead of coming in and already knowing, you know, what you're supposed to know and celebrating yourself for already having that information, we try to celebrate the struggle in my classroom. So um, it's okay to not know something. It's okay to not understand something. And it's within that struggle that you actually grow and can be successful. I mean, I just think that the main thing about, um, about you know, teaching is that for me is that I'm just really passionate about it like I come in here every day and I just really I care about what the t what I'm teaching the students and what um, and what they're learning so you promote an environment where a student can challenge themselves and it's okay not to reach the mountaintop but you know you should try to challenge yourself on occasion and through trying is how you reach the mountaintop mm -hmm. so sometimes I'll just say what do we do and they say we celebrate the struggle because it's okay to not know things. It's actually more interesting to not know things because then you can learn and learning is fun. Well, that completes our tour of four dynamic schools and four dynamic educators. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Difference Makers and the ongoing celebration of quality instruction. At Atlanta Public Schools, we're renewing our commitment to you. Thank you.